Pints with Jack, Season 4, Episode 25. After Hours with Father Vincent Lampert. Welcome, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast where Matt, Andrew, and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we're eavesdropping on the correspondence of a senior demon, Screwtape, as he explains how to tempt the patient, a human assigned to be tempted by Screwtape's nephew, Wormwood. Each week, we'll be considering a different letter, untwisting Screwtape's hellish logic, and forming a battle plan for our own spiritual lives. However, today is a Thursday, and is therefore an after-hours episode, and today I'm interviewing Father Vincent Lampert. Reverend Lampert grew up in a large Roman Catholic family that was active in the faith on the west side of Indianapolis, Indiana. For a couple of years, he studied political sciences at Indiana University before transferring to the St. Minraid Seminary to study for the priesthood. He was ordained in 1991, so he's been a priest for about 30 years and is currently the pastor of two parishes in Brookville, Indiana, St. Peter's, and also St. Michael the Archangel. He has now been designated He has been the designated exorcist of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Indianapolis for the last 15 years, being appointed in 2005. And he's just released a book, Exorcism, The Battle Against Satan and His Demons. Father Vincent, welcome to Pints for Jack. Yes, it's good to be with you. Now, as listeners will know, this season we've been reading the Screwtape Letters, Lewis's satirical letters between a senior and a junior demon. I therefore thought that it would be a good idea at some point this season to invite on an exorcist to this show. And we'll be talking about your ministry shortly, but first of all, we have some housekeeping items. First of all, the quote of the week, and today we're drawing from Scripture and the Epistle of St. James, where he writes, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And the next thing is our drink of the week. Since we're recording around lunchtime, I'm drinking a rather admittedly bizarre combination. Uh, I take a little bit of cucumber and lime Gatorade and use that as a cordial, and then I top it up with sparkling water. It might sound weird, but trust me, it's very refreshing. Uh, Father, are you drinking anything? Tea, coffee, water, or something more exciting? Just water right now, just water. (laughs) (laughs) And we normally toast a gold-level Patreon supporter, but we don't have anyone today, and that's probably a good thing, because we've got a lot to get through. So I'll simply say, Cheers. Cheers. So, Father Vincent, could you please kick things off by telling us a little bit about your religious background and your journey to priesthood? Yes, as you mentioned, I grew up in uh, Indianapolis in the state of Indiana. I'm one of nine children. My mother was a convert to the Catholic faith. She never really liked the word convert. She always said that she just discovered that she was Catholic all along. She just didn't know it until she learned about the Catholic faith. And uh, she was very instrumental. We all attended Catholic grade school, Catholic high school. And so certainly along the way, I was uh, encouraged to consider priesthood. I even had a religious sister when I was in the fifth grade who told me one day that she thought I would make a good priest one day. I don't know why that always stuck with me. And then after high school, it was something that I considered. And then after spending a couple of years at Indiana University, I decided to uh, transfer to uh, the College Seminary of St. Meinrad in southern Indiana. It's run by the Benedictine Order. And then I finished my uh, studies there and then did graduate studies at the University of St. Mary of the Lake, Mungaline Seminary in the northern suburbs of Chicago. And then I was ordained a priest on June the 1st, 1991, and have been a priest now for the past 29 years. Wonderful. Now... Obviously, we're a C.S. Lewis podcast, and we refer to C.S. Lewis by his nickname, Jack. Uh, And so I have to ask, have you had much contact with his works? I have. I I enjoy reading a lot. So uh, in my days in the seminary, both college and graduate, I spent a lot of time in the library reading a lot of Lewis's works. And uh, certainly that helped to uh, mold and shape my understanding of the demonic. So when I was appointed to this ministry felt like I had a good background that was, uh, again, helped to be shaped by the works of C.S. Lewis. And this appointment to be exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, how did that actually even come about? (laughs) (laughs) So in 2005, the exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis passed away. 
the Archdiocese of Indianapolis historically has always had a stably appointed exorcist, even when it fell out of practice. In many dioceses across the United States, Indianapolis continued to have one. And after he passed away, ironically, he was the priest at the uh, grade school where I attended. And after he passed away, the archbishop was looking for a replacement. He knew that I was planning to be on sabbatical in the early part of 2006 at the North American College in Rome. So he uh, he told me one day, he said, while you're on sabbatical, I have something else for you to study. And then he <laughs> said, I'm appointing you to be the exorcist. He even said, I have no idea what I'm asking you to do. But uh, while you're on sabbatical, this is something else that you can study. Wow. <laughs> now, what you just said there makes me think that it used to be the case that every diocese would have an exorcist. Is that not the case anymore? No. Uh, in fact, the, the local bishop technically is the exorcist in his diocese by virtue of his Episcopal ordination. When I was appointed back in '05, I became one of only about 12 stably appointed exorcists in the United States. Today, that number is probably somewhere around 125. So more priests have been appointed over the past 15 years. The exact number is unknown simply because some prefer to remain anonymous. But it's my guess there's somewhere around 125 now who have been appointed by their bishop to uh, do this ministry in their diocese. Why do you think the bishop chose you? <laughs> he, actually, he actually told me why one day when I asked him. He said he wanted a priest who believed in the reality of evil, but not one that would be too quick to believe that everyone who came to me was actually up against the forces of evil. Because an exorcist really is trained to be a skeptic. I should be the last one to believe that somebody is really dealing with extraordinary demonic activity. And so he was looking for someone who uh, he said was well-balanced, thought had a good spiritual life, and also had been ordained long enough because uh, the church does say that it, obviously a newly ordained priest should not be appointed to this ministry because he's still in the process of kind of uh, putting together and forming his own priestly identity. And since at the time I had been ordained for 14 years, he believed that I was a good candidate for that. He even told me the fact that I wasn't looking for the job made me a good candidate he said anybody who would want the job, he would worry about. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that. <laughs> so you go on sabbatical, you go to Rome. What did this training look like? Well, the, the church says the best way to train is the apprenticeship model. So to find a seasoned exorcist and kind of allow him to take you under his wing. So I found a Franciscan priest there in Rome who uh, had been doing the ministry for 25 years. He had been trained, along with Father Gabriel Amorth, by Father Canido Amentini, a passionist priest, now deceased, but servant of God. He's on the way of being canonized a saint. And Father Canido used to do exorcisms at the Holy Stairs in Rome, just across from the Basilica of St. John Lateran. In fact, if you visit there today at the top of the stairs to the left, there's a chapel in the back, and there is a bust of uh, Father Canido Amentini. So uh, Father, uh, the priest that trained me, Father Carmine, allowed me to sit in on 40 exorcisms while I was there in Rome for three months. And that allowed me to learn firsthand the ministry uh, of the church to those who were up against the forces of evil and were seeking help. Wow. <laughs> I, I've been to those holy stairs. I had no idea that that also went on there. Um, I'd like your opinion on something, because one of the things that we've read fairly recently in Screwtape was about the question of overt demonic presence. Uh, so Wormwood writes to his uncle, and he's basically asking, should he reveal himself to his patient? And Screwtape says, well, for the time being, the high command, that should really be low command, but anyway, uh, it says high command in hell has, uh, has said that, by and large, that they should hide their presence. Whereas in days past, they were a little bit more overt. Do you think that's actually true? I think that is true because demons prefer to work in the shadows. If they reveal themselves, then the battle against them can begin. But if they're working overtly, then perhaps people don't even realize what's going on and they can do their damage under the cover of darkness, so to speak. But one could say, 
a good way of looking at the rite of exorcism of the church is that it commands the demons to manifest, to reveal themselves, to no longer hide in the shadows. And then once they're dragged forth, then the battle against them will begin. Hmm. Now, you've recently published a book, Exorcism, the Battle Against Satan and His Demons. And I'm sure you're a very busy man. So what motivated you to write this book? Why did you think this was needed? Well, I was asked to write the book by a a Jesuit priest after I gave a talk at St. Louis University. The priest there thought that my uh, presentation would be one that many people could benefit from. This was about three years ago. I really didn't pay much attention to it, and then I was encouraged again. And then when we went into COVID lockdown, (laughs) I found a lot of free time on my hands. (laughs) And then it gave me the opportunity to uh, kind of put my story together, so to speak, and then to put it out there. But the main motivation is to um, help educate people on the reality of evil and what the church does to combat it. Because there's a lot of people today that, that laugh at the topic. They're like, certainly the church doesn't believe that evil is personified. Isn't that more of a metaphor? So it's a way of putting out there what the church actually teaches so that people can be informed. So what actually happens when someone reaches out to you for an exorcism? What's the process that you go through? Well, initially, hopefully the the first person that somebody will talk to if they believe they're dealing with the demonic would be their uh, local uh, pastor, the parish priest. What's interesting is that more than half the people who contact me are not Catholic. They come from other Christian faith traditions or other world religions, maybe no faith background whatsoever. If they do come from a faith background, I always like to know that they've talked to the minister of their faith because that minister needs to be involved in some capacity. There's no way that I could take under my wing everyone that I've worked with over the last 15 years. It's kind of like going to see your family doctor, who then may refer you to a specialist, but eventually you go back to the family doctor for ongoing care. But if they do reach me, if they're referred to me, there's a protocol that we use in the United States, uh, just so the, because an exorcist needs to reach moral certitude. I have to believe beyond a doubt that the person in front of me is truly dealing with extraordinary demonic activity in his or her life. Number one would be the person needs to have a psychiatric evaluation. So the church wants to know from a mental health expert, is there something about this person's condition that is beyond your understanding? Number two on the protocol would be a physical examination by the person's family doctor. So the church wants to know, is there a physical explanation for what the person is going through? Now, it's important to note that the church is asking the psychiatrist or the doctor, do you think this person is possessed? The church herself will make that determination, but the church does want experts in these fields to weigh in on the matter, again, so that I can reach that moral certitude. Step three of the protocol would be for me to um, meet with the person to go through an intake questionnaire, trying to determine where did the extraordinary demonic you know, begin in the person's life. What was the entry point? Because identifying the entry point lets me know what doorway needs to be closed in this person's life so that the demonic will go away. Step four, the protocol would be to um, look for extraordinary signs of demonic activity that are spelled out in the rite of the church, uh, the ability to speak and understand languages otherwise unknown to the individual, exhibiting superhuman strength, having elevated perception, and then an aversion to anything of a sacred nature. And then step five is the most important one, I believe, helping the person resume their spiritual life or bringing them to a spiritual life for the very first time. Now that you spoke about speaking to doctors, psychiatrists, and other medical professionals, and when I told our patrons that I was going to get you on the show, a lot of the questions revolved around the interaction between medicine, mental health, and demonic possession. And one person even pointed out that in the Gospel of Luke, he distinguishes between the sick people that Jesus healed and the possessed people that he exercised. Um, and given that Luke was most likely a doctor, that kind of makes sense that he would like to make those sorts of distinctions. Mm-hmm. So. 
you make use of other professionals to make their assessment. It, is there some kind of relationship between those three, between medicine, mental health, and spiritual possession, or can they sometimes be completely separate? Well, sometimes there can be both at play. One could be dealing with uh, the demonic in their life, but also have a mental health condition. My experience over the last 15 years that it's not always completely 100% one or the other, but sometimes both can be in play at the same time. And the reason, if you look at the mental health issue, the question I would ask would be, did the person suffer some type of demonic episode that caused the mind to fracture as a way to try to comprehend and to deal with what was happening in the person's life? And again, that's why it's even important to have a mental health expert weigh in at the very beginning. It isn't that the church is doubting the person, but the person's mental health does need to be in a good place before an exorcism could begin. Otherwise, the person might even be fractured even more. And ultimately, the goal of the psychiatrist, the medical doctor, or the priest should be to bring relief and healing into the life of the one who is suffering, whether that be to spiritual, physical, or mental causes. And so sometimes it might be the equivalent of that you have to treat the symptoms before you can actually get to the cause. Correct. And sometimes maybe even vice versa. Okay. Mm -hmm. Virtually all of the other questions that we received from listeners revolved around the right of exorcism itself. They basically want to know, what is it like? What actually happens? <laughs> An exorcism at its very core is a prayer. So it's a prayer asking God to bring deliverance into the life of the person who is suffering. A part of that prayer does include a command to the demon or demons to depart. So if I'm going to do an exorcism, I prepare myself. As a priest, I would celebrate Mass, go to confession, spend time in prayer. I determine where the exorcism will take place. It's always on a sacred space. So in a church or in a chapel, it would never be in somebody's home. And again, because the devil doesn't get to choose where he will be defeated, the church herself will make that determination. I will determine who else is going to be present, such as uh, certainly myself, the afflicted, another family member or friend. I would also have someone else there, another priest, deacon, even lay faithful who are there to pray. And then once it begins, you know, an exorcism begins by blessing the person with holy water. The holy water reminds us of our baptism into Christ by which we have become a new creation. There is the litany of the saints calling upon our Blessed Mother and the saints to come and to be present during this very particular prayer of the church. After that, there is the recitation of one or many of the Psalms, the reading of the gospel, accounts of Jesus casting out the demons. It's a reminder to the demons that they've been defeated before and they will be defeated again. So why resist the power and the authority of Christ? You get the person to uh, make a profession of faith, either renew baptismal promises or to recite the creed. And then uh, there's a laying on of hands of the head of the person. Throughout the rite, I could be reciting the Our Father, the Hail Mary prayer, saying those prayers give me, gives me an opportunity just to step back and kind of assess the situation. How is the demon reacting to the ritual of the church? There is the insufflation prayer, the breathing on of the face of the person. Jesus breathed on his disciples, invoking the Holy Spirit. Wherever the Holy Spirit is present, an unclean spirit cannot remain. So uh, that is done. And then after that, there is a supplicating exorcism prayer, asking God to help uh, deliver and free this person. And then there is an imperative prayer or command, and that's where I would give a command to the demon to depart. And then the ritual needs to be prayed through completely throughout the rite. If I observe that certain parts of the rite seem to be more efficacious, then I can go back and repeat those parts. Uh, the ritual can be repeated over and over and over again until the demons are cast out. And then at the very end, there would be a prayer of thanksgiving. The priest that trained me in Rome, even 
even once the demons were cast out, would give the person the opportunity to receive the sacrament of reconciliation if that is something that they desired. But again, the most important thing to remember is that an exorcism at its very core is a prayer. And what's the role for things like crucifixes and holy water? Uh, among our listeners, we've got people from across Christian denominations that don't really have those things. Mm -hmm. And like most of us, their primary education on exorcisms are the movies. <laughs> and so you see those things in the movies. So what role do they play? Well, one should never view those things as, you know, items in and of themselves that somehow it's the water that's causing the demon to leave or the crucifix. But they point to something greater. Again, the water reminds us of the sacrament of baptism. The crucifix reminds us that the moment the devil believed that he had won, Jesus is dying on the cross. The moment of his perceived victory actually becomes the moment of his defeat. So during an exorcism, the things that the priest is doing, you could say he's literally throwing into the face of the demon those main components of our Christian faith that the demons themselves have rejected. So it's throwing those into the demon's face, causing them to lose their grip on this person and then to be cast out. Now, as I said, people's primary education on all this sort of thing is Hollywood. So just in broad strokes, what does Hollywood tend to get right and get wrong when it comes to <laughs> movies about exorcists? I think they get right the, uh, the manifestations. So a lot of the things that Hollywood shows in those movies is true. They do happen. You know, there are people that can levitate. There's eyes rolled in the back of the head, the foaming at the mouth, bodily contortions. A person can drop on the ground and slither like a snake when the demon uh, manifests through them. There can be a change in the temperature of the room. It can become very cold. The person's voice will change, becoming deeper and more authoritative. Because, again, the demon is trying to uh, take control, if you will, of that particular prayer of the church so that he can disrupt it. Uh, so, again, Hollywood gets all those right. What Hollywood gets wrong is that they focus too much on what the devil is doing. Whereas in the right of the church, the focus is always on what God is doing. So as an exorcist, I'm not really that interested in the theatrics of the devil, I'm more interested in the power of God that is at work in this particular prayer of the church. Because demons have power. They can only be defeated by power. The power that defeats them is the power of God. And the ritual of exorcism is how the church calls upon the power of God to defeat the demon. I always tell people that if you're relying on me as an individual to defeat the devil, we're all in trouble. But if we're relying on the power of God at work through his minister, then that's the right place to be. I was going to say the priest had trained me before I left Rome. I just sat down and had a one-on-one -on -one with him, kind of recapping the past three months and asking questions. And the final thing he told me was this. If you're ever doing an exorcism and you say to yourself, wow, look at what I'm doing, he said, you've just walked on unholy ground. Because you shifted the focus away from the power of God into thinking that the power resides with you as an individual. And what I've seen today is that many people who contact me, if they don't have a faith background, are beginning to view the Catholic exorcist as a magician. You know, I somehow I have the magic, the magic's in the holy water and the crucifix and those types of things. So they're, they're looking for a quick fix. But again, the church wants to connect that person with a relationship with God. But unfortunately, there are people that contact me today who really don't want anything to do with God. They believe the power is in me. And that's certainly something that I immediately refute. And you saying that reminds me of something that Lewis wrote when he said that we want God to come and fix something that's bugging us, but we don't want him to do any more. <laughs> we, we basically want him to leave us alone. He said when he was a child, when he had toothache, he wanted his mother to give him an aspirin. But what she did was give him an aspirin and then take him to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> but related to that, I, I mean, 
the next question I had is you kind of undermined it, <laughs> but in a good way, because I was going to say, you know, your role as an exorcist in opposing evil seems clear. And I was going to ask, what can non-ordained Christians do? But I suppose that, that question still stands. What, what, is, what is our job? What is our role in uh, opposing evil? And how do we even talk about the devil in a world that refuses to believe in him? Well, the first part of that question, I think the number one thing that we can do as people of faith is to live out our relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, it isn't the extraordinary things that will keep the devil at bay. It's the very ordinary aspects of our Christian faith. So if we take our faith seriously, so will the devil. But if we don't take our faith seriously, neither will the devil. I think that's why we see an uptick in people today who are seeking an exorcism, because faith is in decline in the lives of many people, even many Christians. You know, they grew up in a Christian home, very faith-filled, but now they've abandoned that faith and now say they're atheist or God is no longer relevant in their lives. But as Christians, you know, look at Catholics in, in a very specific way. If one is a Catholic, if they're going to Mass, if they're celebrating the sacraments, if they're praying, if they're reading the Word of God, the devil's already on the run. We don't have to do anything extraordinary. You know, I jokingly tell some of my priest friends, somebody will come to me and say, the devil's after me. I'm like, great, pray. And they're like, no, what do you really want me to do? <laughs> and I jokingly say to them, if I told the person to go out at midnight at the next full moon, and to hop on one leg and howl at the moon and swing a dead cat around their head, they would look at me and go, where do I get the cat? <laughs> People are always ready to do the extraordinary. But again, it is the ordinary aspects of our Christian faith that will defeat the devil. So I think for Christians, if we can just rediscover our Christian roots, that's the best way to defeat the devil. I'm remembering Naaman in the Old Testament when he comes to the man of God and he's about to leave disappointed because he said, oh, just go and wash in the stream. He says, oh, we've got more impressive streams elsewhere. And one of his servants says, listen, if he'd asked you to do something difficult, you'd have done it. The fact that he's just asking you to go and wash seven times in a river, that's so much easier. It, it, it's hilarious how we resist the simplest of things. It is. And I think, you know, the simplest of things would be for us to live out our faith, you know, pray daily, go to church on Sunday. Again, those very simple things, ordinary things, is how we uh, keep the devil at bay. But when we don't live that out, when we retreat from our faith, I think the devil advances. So right now, I think if we were to return to our faith, it's a way to push the devil back and to uh, bring God uh more greatly into the picture once again. As we head towards the end of this interview, whenever the topic of spiritual evil and demons come up, so does Harry Potter. And <laughs> I've heard some Christians say that those books really help their faith, and others that say that it's the worst thing ever. And of those who are in the anti-Potter camp, because of the presence of magic, they will sometimes also include works like J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, and Lewis's own Chronicles of Narnia. So what are your thoughts on that matter? Well, I think we have to, when we look at literature in general, we have to ask the question, what lesson is it trying to convey? You look at the Chronicles of Narnia, I don't think the focus is on the power of evil. I think it's trying to focus on the power of good. You look at things like Harry Potter, to me, the focus is on the power of evil, because all magic is inherently evil. And I don't mean an illusionist, somebody pulling a rabbit out of their hat, but magic at its very core is inherently evil. You think, look at things like Harry Potter, it presents evil as something good. So there can be a danger in that. I will say that if people are watching movies and reading the books, if you're filtering that through your Catholic faith or your Christian faith in general, then you can use that as a teachable moment. So it is true that people can read Harry Potter and grow deeper in their faith, but those people probably know their faith well enough 
I think there's a lot of young people that don't know their faith. You know, if you ask them, okay, you picked up and read Harry Potter, when's the last time you picked up and read the Bible? <laughs> As a Catholic, when's the last time you picked up the Catechism of the Catholic Church? So if you're not balancing it with your Christian faith, I think that's where the danger comes in. Just to end, how has this ministry shaped your own faith? I think it's helped to solidify my faith. I also believe that it's helped me to uh, rediscover the uh, importance of priesthood. You know, there are fewer priests in the church today. Priests are pulled in many different directions. You know, in addition to uh, being the exorcist, I'm the pastor of two parishes here in southeastern Indiana. I, I tell people I sometimes feel like I live in my car. <laughs> so there is that danger that priesthood becomes an occupation rather than a vocation. And for me, the word vocation means a calling from God. I do what I do because it's what I believe God has called me to do. So being the exorcist has helped me to rediscover priesthood as a vocation. So it's helped to solidify that. Because, you know, being ordained in 1991, there are uh, many priests that were ordained along with me or in the 1990s who have left the priesthood. So it was a very challenging time, I think, for many priests, you know, and I think that uh, the ministry has helped me to uh, keep my feet firmly planted in this vocation that God has given to me. Beautiful. Father Vincent, thank you for coming on the show and talking to us about your ministry. Uh, to wrap up the episode, can you please tell people where they can find out more about you, your book, and your work? Yes. Yeah, so again, the book that I wrote again is... Um, Exorcism, the Battle Against Satan and His Demons. It's put out by Emmaus Road Publishing. It's also available on Amazon. And again, it's just a way that I want to introduce people to a very uh, basic understanding of the ministry of exorcism and how the devil is at work or trying to uh, be at work in our lives. Thank you. And thanks to all our top tier supporters, Jeff, Chris, John, Kate and Rowdy. This episode will be coming out at the start of the new year, so why not have a New Year's resolution to only drink the finest whiskies out of a laser-etched Pints with Jack Glencarren glass? They're available for purchase on our website, pintswithjack.com. And as we said before, we don't make any money from these purchases, but we do get a lot of happiness from people sending us pictures of themselves drinking out of these wonderful glasses. It improves the taste by at least 20%. Many people imagine that exorcisms are a thing of the past. So if you enjoyed this episode, please share it on social media with your friends, and it might provide an opportunity to talk about your faith. Father, to close the show, would you please give us your blessing? The Almighty God sent his blessing upon all of you. May he watch over, bless, and protect you, and keep you safe. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And listeners, please join us next time when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>